the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello and welcome to Short Circuit, your bi-weekly podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeal. I'm your host, John Ross, joined this week by IJ litigators Diana Simpson and Robert Ebert Johnson. Before we begin, I call your attention to last month's Cato Unbound debate on judicial engagement. Evan Burnick has the lead essay, which he defended from critiques from several scholars. We'll provide a link on the SoundCloud page. This week on the show, ballot selfies, 3D printer guns, and some new evidence in a death penalty case. Diana, kick us off. So our first case here comes to us from the First Circuit by way of New Hampshire. And way back in the 1800s, New Hampshire um, was very concerned about um, vote buying and voter intimidation. So the state uh, took a series of steps to require that the state itself prepare ballots for elections rather than organizations and unions and political parties, which had been the practice up to that time. Uh, And so this was 125 years ago, the state passes these laws. And then later they passed another law saying that um, it was illegal for anyone to allow his ballot to be seen by somebody else with the intention of letting it be known how he's about to vote. So this goes on for over 100 years. This is the, the state of things. Well, back in 2014, the state then decided that it needed to eliminate the scourge of ballot selfies, which is such a millennial problem I don't even know how to describe. Um, But so the state decided that it was illegal to take a digital image or photograph of a marked ballot and distribute or share the image by social media. Uh, So... The state didn't just outlaw this activity, it was enforcing this law. And so it enforced the law against these three people who, um, for a variety of reasons, decided to share their ballot selfies, one in an act of civil disobedience, one in an act act of um, deciding to tell the government how he felt about their um, candidates. And, And just to be clear, one of these people had voted for his dog as a write in candidate. So this is not someone who likely was intimidated by uh, nefarious forces into into voting for his dog. Well, you never know about the dog. But there was no evidence, and that's that's a really important thing in this case, that there is absolutely no evidence that ballot selfies were leading to an increase in voter intimidation or vote buying or anything. It's just, it's it's such a millennial thing to do, to take a selfie and post it on the internet, and people are excited about, about voting. You know, I remember back when I had, you know, I cast my first ballot, oh, those many years ago. I was really excited about it, and if ballot selfies were a thing then, I probably would have taken one, whether... I should admit that or not. I don't know. So, Rob, this is a First Amendment case, which means the government needs to provide some evidence that the law is necessary. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we're taking ourselves out of the deference land of many parts of the Constitution. And because we're dealing with core political speech, the court is going to require actual evidence. And to be fair, in this case, the government did have some evidence of vote buying. It just happened that all of the evidence was over 100 years old. There or was also either Hitler or Saddam Hussein for real that's that was the that was the only recent evidence from the from the 20th century was either of Hitler or Saddam Hussein and their regime's use of voter intimidation and fraud and to be fair there was one legislator who said that she had heard from somebody that people on some college campus somewhere were being fi- paid $50 to vote for democrats uh, you know obviously evidence that, that you could take very seriously So the court looks at all of this and says, you know, there's no real evidence of any problem in New Hampshire. There's no evidence that anybody is is buying votes or intimidating people to vote. And against that, you have a very real harm to people's First Amendment uh, interests here. I mean, one of the things that's sort of crazy about this case is they're not just this is not just a law that was passed in the abstract where people are saying, maybe the government's going to come after me. But you actually have investigators from the government who are calling people up and saying, you are under investigation because of pictures that you posted on social media, including this guy who posted a photo, again, showing that he voted for his dog, who then gets a call from the government saying, we are going to come after you. Another of the plaintiffs, who is actually a candidate for office, uh, posted a photo once he learned that investigators were investigating and said, come at me, bro, on Facebook. Yeah, clearly a criminal offense. <laughs> a very millennial thing to say, as, as Diane has mentioned. They did come after him. And they did him, come after him. But he is getting, I think, perhaps the, the last laugh on this. And, you know, one of the things the court points out that is a very good point is that if New Hampshire is so worried about vote selling and all of the harms that it causes, it could actually criminalize vote selling, which is not currently illegal in New Hampshire. Now, the district court ruled on strict scrutiny that this was unconstitutional, but here uh, the the First Circuit says uh, under intermediate scrutiny it fails. What's the difference? 
So basically, you've got three levels of constitutional review. You've got rational basis, which means anything goes. You have strict scrutiny, which means you almost always are going to succeed if you're a plaintiff. The law is almost always going to be constitutional. And then intermediate scrutiny just means, well, we're actually going to look at this seriously, and we're going to look at the evidence, and we're going to try and figure out if this law makes sense. So, you know, as we've described, the court looks at the evidence here and looks at the uh, rationale and says, you know, one, there's really no evidence here. And two, you could protect against this concern in a lot of different ways, including by outlawing the very thing you're concerned about, which is buying and selling votes. I will say I did find it frustrating that the court applied intermediate scrutiny and not strict scrutiny. And, and when doing this, the court said, you know, we we don't want to resolve the debate over whether intermediate or strict applies. Um, this law fails even under intermediate scrutiny. But I think it's clear after the, the Reed v. Town of Gilbert decision, which the district court relied on quite heavily, that this law fails strict scrutiny and that strict scrutiny applied and this law can't pass. Um, so I, I wish the First Circuit had actually applied the standard that, that the Supreme Court has indicated applies. But just to be fair, they also say in a footnote that they don't decide that it doesn't apply. They just don't need to reach the issue. So it doesn't preclude a, a later court in the First Circuit from saying that strict scrutiny does apply in this kind of circumstance. Okay, let's move now to the Fifth Circuit. Rob? All right. So uh, here out of the Fifth Circuit, we have a case about a uh, outfit called Defense Distributed, a nonprofit that uh, is organized in order to uh, put onto the internet computer files that contain instructions for 3D printers to print uh, firearms. So they earlier had put on um, instructions for how to print a, uh, a small plastic pistol. And these instructions had been downloaded about 200,000 times. And now, more recently, what they want to put on the internet are instructions to print the, um, the body of an AR-15 rifle. And uh, they are contacted by none other than the State Department, which says, you know, it might be legal to distribute all of this within the United States, but by putting them on the internet, where people can access these things overseas, you are exporting firearms in violation of a statute that prohibits the export of firearms. And under this law, they're saying that all of these plans have to be submitted to the State Department for pre-approval before they can be printed on the internet. And so the nonprofit takes them off the internet, submits them for pre-approval, and what happens, Diana? Uh, they don't get it. Um, but in the meantime, there were other third-party um, groups and sites like the Pirate Bay that have um, put, put that have also put these online and continue to share them. And so these these files continue to be available even today and have since been downloaded in, in this number of years that all of this is pending. Nonetheless, the nonprofit still wants to put them online, and so they've sued, saying that it's a violation of their First Amendment rights. Rob, what's the Fifth Circuit say? So this case... Uh, comes to the Fifth Circuit by way of the district court, which the district court says uh, they're not going to grant what's called a preliminary injunction, saying that this is going to be shut down pending a final decision. And the, the district court says this for three reasons, because it's a three-factor test. They say, first, uh, you haven't shown that you have a First Amendment right to post this stuff. Second, there's a grave national danger if these things are posted. And third, um, you know, balancing the national danger against your own interests. We just think the national danger is more important. So the case comes up for the Fifth Circuit, and the, what the Fifth Circuit says is, well, we're just going to bracket the issue of whether this is constitutional or not. And we're just going to say that because there is this important national interest, uh, we think that that outweighs any potential First Amendment interest you might have. And based on this national interest, even if this injunction, even if uh, what the government is doing to you is unconstitutional, we're going to let it continue uh, for the duration of the lawsuit until we come to a final decision because we think the national interest here is just so important. And it bears emphasis that this is just absolutely wrong. So it is like established black letter law that if you have a constitutional violation, you are entitled to a preliminary injunction uh, because a constitutional violation is an injury that would be more important than any other sort of interest that the government could weigh against it. And so what the Fifth Circuit is doing here is, is really contrary to black letter law that you could read in, in a law school textbook. Judge Jones dissents, and she very much agrees with what Rob has just said. Uh, you know, she goes through the merits of the case and says, basically, the plaintiffs are 
probably going to win. Um, but what's even worse is is what the majority did uh, in looking at national security and the first the First Amendment. And she has this great quote in here where she says the where she in talking about the majority she says they are willing to overlook um, the the threat to protected speech with a rote incantation of national security, an incantation belied by the facts here and nearly forty years of contrary executive branch pronouncements. And that does seem to be the case here. You know, the government said, oh, but we have a national security interest and all rational conversation about what is constitutional, what is not constitutional, what harm will follow just goes out the window and, it, and everything is just, you know, it's all about national security, whether that's an, an actually a true risk here. Yeah, that's one of the interesting things here is there's sort of a, ignoring the lessons of history. So there's a, a famous case from the 1970s called United States versus Progressive Inc., where a magazine wanted to publish what it claimed were the secrets of uh, hydrogen bombs and how hydrogen nuclear bombs were constructed. And the government said, oh, you can't do that. And these, these weren't confidential documents. They were things that they had obtained through the public sphere and just assembled into one place. And the government said, you can't do that. They obtained a preliminary injunction against the publication of the material. But then in the interim during the lawsuit, other people published it in their, in their own publications. And so the government ultimately had to abandon that lawsuit on the ground that at the end of the day, the information got out anyway. Uh, and that's exactly what's going to happen here. I mean, sure, you can stop Defense Distributed from publishing this information, but somebody is going to publish this information. As Diana said, it's already available on the Pirate Bay. So at the end of the day, um, you know, regardless of the merits of this, it's, it's a fool's errand to try to stop the uh, circulation of this kind of information on the Internet or otherwise. And coming back to what Rob was saying earlier, you know, this is at a preliminary injunction. So the court hasn't ruled on the merits. The district court hasn't addressed the evidence. And and the majority did say, you know, once we look at the evidence, you know, it, you know, it, it might end up being different. Um, and so it might be the case that when it comes back up on appeal after the parties have fully fleshed out the evidence and, and developed the record, that the majority then will say, Okay, this is actually constitutional. Or, um, I'm sorry that this is actually protected activity, and that the um, defense distributed has the right, after all, to post this material and other material like it. And of course, there's a huge irony there because the whole point of the First Amendment is that you can't have prior restraints, or you can't prevent the publication of information pending some decision by a government body. But that's exactly what the FISERC is doing here. They're saying, well, let's just put in place a prior restraint, and then we'll decide later if we think that this is something that you have a constitutional right to publish. And that's just not how the First Amendment works. And in the interim, the defense distributed would have been unable to speak for, you know, three, five, seven, however many years it's going to take ultimately to to resolve this case. OK, let's move now to the Seventh Circuit. Diana? So this case arises out of the state of Indiana, where the defendant Wayne is sitting on death row for the murders of his wife, Beth, Beth's ex-husband, Rick, and Beth's son, Aaron. And there is a crucial piece of evidence that was not allowed at trial that essentially it's the the best friend of Aaron, Mandy, uh, stated that she saw Aaron and Rick after the time that they were supposed to have been killed by Wayne. Diana, that seems like a fairly important piece of evidence. Why wasn't that presented at trial? So it is an important piece of evidence. In fact, it is it is the strongest piece of evidence that Wayne has as to his innocence. And Wayne, remember, is sitting on death row, you know, preparing for his execution for this crime. Um, but Indiana has an evidentiary rule that does not allow the use of recorded recollections. And so Mandy, th this, this evidence came about by Mandy being uh, interviewed by the police four days after the murders happened. And so she wasn't under oath. She This wasn't a, a scenario where the attorneys for the parties were present. Uh, it was a conversation she was having with the police. She seems fairly relaxed, um, and her mother was there as well. Um, but so the, the evidence rule in Indiana um, doesn't allow this type of hearsay because Mandy needed to subsequently uh, testify that she remembered all of this, and she suddenly had a case of forgetting everything. And yeah, she's nine so, years old, so that's right, it's so not... Years Years have gone by, and, and the first time that this is tried is several years later. The second time that this, a retrial happens, she's now 16 years old. And as a 16-year-old, um, 
you know, she says, you know, look, I, I don't remember, I don't remember the events of the day. I don't remember any of it. And I certainly don't even remember being interviewed by the police or saying anything that I said to them. Sorry. So this case has been tried once and then it got thrown out by the Indiana Supreme Court. Then it, he got convicted a second time. And now that conviction has been challenged in federal district court, federal appeals court. And now this is a federal appeals court on bonk decision. Yes. So a lot of judges have considered Wayne's innocence or the evidence uh, and a lot of things are surrounding Wayne's conviction. Um, but the en banc Seventh Circuit here decides that the state court's refusal to admit that evidence um, requires that Wayne get a new trial because there's a decision out of the U.S. Supreme Court called Chambers um, where the Seventh Circuit interprets Chambers to mean that this evidence must be admitted because even in light of all of the evidentiary rules, because the due process clause of the U.S. Constitution requires that this evidence be admitted because it was it's sufficiently reliable. Yeah. So basically what Chambers says is that, you know, that's a case where somebody was convicted of uh, shooting a police officer and there was somebody else who had confessed to shooting this police officer. And there were multiple witnesses who said they'd seen this other person convict the police officer. And the state court had said, oh, well, you don't get to uh, introduce all of that evidence. And the, and the Supreme Court said, you know, that just can't be right. You have a fundamental constitutional right if there is reliable, relevant evidence that goes to the question of whether you're innocent or guilty, you have a right to present that to the jury. And here what the Seventh Circuit is saying is, look, you know, a jury might get this evidence and they might agree with they might agree with the state's theory that Mandy, as the state has subsequently argued, was mistaken as to the day that she saw this person alive. Or they might not. They might instead think that the statement made days after the events is is a more reliable indicator than any other evidence. And that's just a question for the jury. And to, to simply hide it from the jury because the government lawyers don't think it's very persuasive evidence is just not how a criminal trial uh, is supposed to go. Well, Rob, there is a dissent in this case. So it, what the dissent is basically saying is there's this federal law called EDPA. And uh, it has an acronym that is a, a total mouthful, but we call it EDPA for short. And it, what it basically says is that federal courts can't overturn state court criminal convictions unless there is directly on point Supreme Court precedent. And the dissent is basically saying, well, you know, you might, or, might be right, you might be wrong, but reasonable judges could disagree. And because there's a statute EDPA, well, we just have to defer to the state courts. And specifically what they're saying is that even though there are all these, pri these previous decisions, none of them concern statements like this one, where it's a uh, out of court statement made by somebody without being under oath and it's made um, without any the attorneys being present to uh, question the witness. And they say, you know, these other, other sort of cases are all distinguishable because they don't involve those precise set of facts. Yeah, and one point they, they make is that it's going to be really difficult to go and develop the corroborating evidence or the impeachment evidence related to what Mandy had to say. And so one of, one of the, the particular examples was that Mandy's mother deposited a check, her paycheck or cashed her paycheck um, that very same day. And so if this happened on Friday or if this happened on Thursday, that's a very important thing for the, the um, reliability of, of Mandy's statement. Um, and that's something that they can very easily check by looking at her paycheck. But this was also 20 years ago. And so this is going to be very difficult to do now. And, and the dissent seems you know, bothered by the fact that all of this evidence is going to be difficult to look at, you know, some 20, 30 years after the fact. But I mean, Wayne is sitting on death row. And so if if it violates the Constitution to not introduce this evidence, which I, I, I agree with the Seventh Circuit here, um, then, you know, it might be difficult, but it should be difficult. We're talking about you know, executing somebody. Yeah, and the flip side of that is if the everybody had done their jobs right the first time around and this evidence had been admitted at the first time around, then it wouldn't have been so hard to find that evidence. And so if you sanction this now because, well, it's too hard to uh, put the, the egg back together after it's fallen off the wall, well, that's just going to mean that more stuff like this keeps going on in the future. And so it, it, for the sort of judicial system to function, there has to be if there was important evidence that was left out, well, then you get a new trial. This is not a time to care about efficiency. So that's what's going to happen in this case, a new trial? Yeah. And so he might be convicted again. Um, they, you know, 
it it could very well be that a, a jury will not believe Mandy's testimony with all of its, you know, subsequent um, problems. It's not it's not testimony with, with Mandy's, um, you know, statement statement. You know, there were problems afterwards and they may very well believe that that she just as a nine year old, she just didn't really know what she was talking about. And that's for a jury to decide. And then they will figure out whether he's guilty, whether he's not guilty and then what the subsequent sentence should be if they find him guilty. Okay, that concludes the show. For more judicial engagement, be sure to follow Diana and Rob on Twitter. Their handles are at Diana K. Simpson and at Free Range Lawyer. And so until next time, this is John Ross from the Institute for Justice, hectoring you to get engaged. (laughs) 